Now, I get asked all the time about the possibility of UK medical students going to practice medicine in the United States of America. There have been some very recent changes to how that process might work in the future, so this video is going to talk about the USMLE and what we'll need to consider as UK medical students moving forward. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Ollie. I'm a third year medical student on the Graduate Entry Medicine Programme at Warwick Medical School. Now the preface to this entire video needs to be that while it is perfectly possible in theory for UK medical graduates to go and work in America, it is relatively very uncommon and we'll go into the reasons why this is um, more in this video. And the reason this video is being made is in response to the changes that have just been announced to the USMLE. And we'll come back to exactly what that is and what it means in a moment. So just a really quick primer on how the American medical education system is different to the UK system that we're used to. Firstly, it's postgraduate only. Obviously, in the UK, while you can do a postgraduate medical degree, such as the four-year program that I'm doing, in America, you require a first degree, a bachelor's of some description before you're allowed to go to medical school. It's the same for law school over there, it's just the way it is. It's also very, very expensive because of, again, the differences in how their university system is set up. Over here, we pay about £9,000 in the UK for a year of tuition. This is the same for virtually any university course. So we're looking at about $60,000-ish for a five-year medical degree. In America, this cost is closer to $200,000, and that's more if you go to a private school. The biggest difference, however, and the focus of this video is the USMLE, the United States Medical Licensing Exam. This is a standardized nationwide test which is taken by everyone studying for an MD degree, the Doctor of Medicine, in the United States. Again, due to differences, there are osteopathic doctors who can take the COMLEX exams, but this, this video is going to focus purely on those studying for an MD who will take the USMLE. And this nationwide standardized exam, although it sounds like a good idea, is actually very different to how we do it in the UK. Medical schools are responsible for setting their own exams for the most part. They are set according to a common curriculum. The GMC uh, sets out the curriculum that every medical student should know. And some elements of medical programs are at least tempted to be standardized. So finals exams, medical schools will often collaborate together in partnerships to provide question banks for each other. And there is some degree of common process that takes place, but we do know this and the stats are out there. Some medical school programs in the UK are harder than others. So the content must therefore be different that you're examined on. And different medical schools prefer certain elements of the curriculum, so some might be heavier on anatomy, some on pathology. And actually, to combat some of these differences, the UK government is introducing a nationwide UK medical licensing assessment, which must be passed alongside your medical school's own finals, so everyone will be taking this standardised test. At the moment, I believe it's due to come in in 2023, but again, discussion for another time. So returning to the USMLE, because it's a standardized test that is taken by everyone studying the same course, it becomes a much more useful marker of how good, in theory, a medical student you are, at least obviously at the time you're examined. It's taken in a few different parts as well that, that come together to form the whole USMLE. So step one covers the kind of more biochemistry, pathology, anatomy, the basic sciences part of medical school. People normally take this in year two of US medical programs. Step one does actually correspond quite well to the pre-clinical parts of UK medical degrees. So again, the first two to three years of UK medicine programs are the basic sciences, although the standard to which they study this in America is comparatively, I think, quite a lot higher than what we're expected to know. Then step two, which is taken in the fourth and final year of US medical school, includes the communication skills and clinical knowledge components of the course. So that's more obviously in combination with the basic science knowledge you have, how are you actually going to deal with patients and treat them? And then step three, the final part, is more about operating as an independent licensed doctor within the United States. And that tends to be taken in the first couple of years of residency, their specialty training equivalent. So ultimately, the focus of this video, step one, 
The basic sciences portion of the course, the exam taken in the second year of medical school, has historically been used as the most reliable indicator of how good a doctor you're going to be. And this has massively influenced the particular specialty residency program that you have been able to apply for and hopefully match into. And obviously, looking at that as it stands, using an exam taken halfway through medical school before you've even started interacting with patients to decide what sort of doctor you're going to be 10, 15 years in the future. That seems absolutely insane. By comparison, our equivalent of these specialty training applications don't even start until we've been practicing as doctors for a couple of years. It's usually even more than that, four to five, because of core medical and core surgical training. And so what comes along with this is that more competitive specialties, the more desirable ones for various reasons, demanded much higher step one scores. So again, your behavior as a relatively junior medical student, let alone a doctor, actually shaped potentially the rest of your career. And it's also the case that US medical residencies tend to favor their own students. It's much easier to match into a competitive specialty as an American graduate than it is as an international medical graduate, such as myself. So what does this mean practically? If you wanna be a neurosurgeon, a dermatologist, something desirable, you need a very, very good step one score and ideally to be an American medical student. You're essentially not matching into these very competitive residencies as an international graduate. It's just not going to happen. That is to say, obviously, unless you're absolutely outstanding, you're performing in the top deciles on step one and you've got some, you know, really good clinical rotations and letters of recommendation. So particularly if you were thinking about doing this as a UK medical student, for example, this would have meant paying for the very expensive tests. You know, they're hundreds of dollars to take each of the parts of STEP, and some parts of it can only be taken in the United States. And you'd also have to be studying for a curriculum that fundamentally does not match the one that you need to pass your UK medical school program. So obviously it means huge amounts of time, effort, and money if this was a path you're thinking about going down. That's not to discourage people from trying to do it. As I say, there are a small handful of people that do go every year and enter US residency training from the UK. I think you just have to know that's what you want to do and be very prepared to put in the effort. But all of this fundamentally has now changed very, very recently as the US MLE, the people responsible for setting it, have announced that step one is now going to be simply pass or fail. In practicality, what that means is that historically it's been reported as a three-digit score and that would be sent to the residency programs that you've applied to. Those programs are no longer going to receive those scores. They will only be told whether you have passed or failed step one. Exactly why they've done this isn't massively clear because I think it kind of came out of the blue for virtually everyone. There was no indication this was going to happen. But a lot of the, the cited reasons seem to be to do with student well-being. Think about the amount of stress that this places on medical students when you've got a couple of years to essentially memorize a curriculum for an exam, one exam, that could shape the rest of your life and would decide whether or not you could be the type of doctor that you wanted to be. And students were piling, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on test materials and preparation for this exam. And it just seemed a bit of a nightmare. So obviously, at first glance, changing this environment seems to be a good idea because the stress very much was on this one exam, unlike in the UK, where our medical school exams are basically, are you going to be a safe doctor or not? We don't really care about anything else. On step one, it was, if you want to be a neurosurgeon, you're going to do well on this exam. Otherwise, you're not going to be a neurosurgeon. But what do I think will happen personally? I think they're going to start using step two clinical knowledge, um, step two CK, to make this assessment because on paper, they're gonna need some way of separating out, you know, the hundreds and thousands of candidates. That's just a reality of these systems. And that might be better because I think the clinical knowledge exams being closer to what our finals exams are like, they're a better assessment of what someone's gonna be like as a practicing doctor. But if that's the case, that simply means that we're shifting the stress from step one to step two. All of the hundreds of hours of preparation and the thousands of dollars on test material and cramming and stress and all the rest of it, we're simply moving that to another point in the course. So will it have the desired effect? <laughs> I really don't know. I think the other very real problem is that without that step one metric, which by and large is something that you work for by yourself, 
Something else that admissions programs could look at is the prestige of the school you went to for medical school and letters of recommendation from well-known and well-connected doctors. Because step one scores have historically been a way for people from less competitive medical schools and international medical graduates to sort of prove their worth against the American standard, that's now gone away, basically. And it might become a case of who you know rather than what you know. And then because of that, I think we will see much more stress coming in on the MCAT, which is the American equivalent of the UCAT, essentially the medical school's admissions test, because if it does become a case of studying at a more prestigious school makes you more likely to match into your residency of choice, that means getting into a top 20 school is therefore much more important, and then your MCAT scores need to be relatively much higher to be more competitive. So instead of all the stress being on step one, we're kind of splitting it and moving some of it to step two and moving some of it back into the MCAT, which was already horribly stressful for people anyway. So ultimately, will this change work? Don't know. I feel like we have to wait and see. And I know this is only going to be relevant for a tiny percentage of you, but I do get asked reasonably often about the possibility of going to work in the US. It's not something that I'm considering for myself. But, you know, for those of you that do want to, I hope this was useful for you. And I do know people that have taken the US MLE and done well on it as UK students. So I'd be happy to put you in touch with people if that's something that you want or try and answer any questions myself. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Take care. Please be sure to hit that like button for me. Leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free videos just like this. Take care and I'll see you next time. If you'd like to support the channel there are three ways you can do it. The first is by liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing. The second is you can buy me a coffee on my Ko-Fi link in the description below. And the third is using my referral link for Complete Anatomy 2020 to save 10% off your first year of the program. You'll get a small kickback when you do. Thanks very much guys, take care and I'll see you next time.